Good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor to welcome you all in the second edition of Oregon City Literature Fest, organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation. I, Apurva Ahuja, will be the anchor for this session. And the topic of this session is Your Grandmother Was More Scientific Than Shots on the Internet. The Science of Indian Cooking. The guest of, for this session is Krish Ashok, sir. He is not a chef, but cooks daily. He is not a scientist, but he can explain science with easy to understand clarity. He is trained to be an electronic engineer, but is now a software engineer. He learned to cook from the woman in his family who can make the perfectly fluffy idli without lecturing people on lactobacillin and pH levels. He likes the scientific method not because it offers him the ability to bully people with knowledge, but because it confidently lets him say, I don't know, let me test it for myself. When he is not cooking, he is usually playing subversive music on the violin. He lives in Chennai with a wife who sagely prevents him from buying more gadgets for the kitchen and a son who has the flora and fauna in the neighborhood terrorized. Handing this session to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Apurva. Uh, I hope I'm uh, audible clearly. And my, and my screen is visible, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, so th thank you. Uh, so I'm actually going to start with a, a bit of a story, right? Um, and that story is uh, it's actually in Italy. Uh, so a friend of mine uh, went with his family to to Italy, a beautiful place. Uh, and then, you know, it's it's been a year since we traveled, all of us traveled. But uh, so this happened uh, a while back. And he went to Italy and he essentially walked into a coffee shop. Uh, and, you know, although the history of coffee itself, history of coffee shops actually kind of goes back to 16th century uh, Britain. Uh, thanks to their colonialism and the fact that they got uh, coffee uh, from Ethiopia and Somalia, what is today Ethiopia and Somalia, right? Coffee shops, obviously, over the next two or three hundred years, became ubiquitous everywhere, right? Um, and more specifically, I think it's the Italians who kind of really uh, dominated that entire space by by sort of inventing espresso, all of the terms that you see everywhere around the world, right? Um, and so we casually walked into this uh, coffee shop in Italy um, and asked for a latte. Uh, we all walked into a coffee shop to ask for lattes and cappuccinos, right? So he asked for a latte, um, and and the barista gave him this, uh, basically gave him a cup of milk. So on that light note, and if you kind of didn't get it, latte in it, 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 Italian just means milk, right? So we kind of use the language uh, to mean something uh, far more general than what it actually means. Italy latte is just milk, right? In the rest of the world, latte is coffee and milk, right? So uh, if you're wondering why that has anything to do uh, with the talk that I'm about to give, um, it is um, because what I want to do is uh, is really talk about one why I wrote this book um, and uh, and to understand that uh, the way I want to explain it is is really think about how we all learn to cook um, and what methods we have um, and what tools and resources we use in order to learn to cook. Right? Um, so it's. I'll kind of connect the relevance of this latte to, to this entire story towards the end. Uh, but cooking is now um, an activity that we do two to three times a day. You know, ever since the pandemic, uh, more people are cooking, more people are learning to cook. Uh, there's only so much, uh, so many number of days that you can keep ordering from Swiggy and Zomato, after which, you know, your health goes for a toss. So what is interesting is, uh, is that more and more people, uh, more and more young people are learning to cook as a result of the pandemic, right? Um, so which kind of raises this rather important question that I asked myself, how do people actually learn to cook, right? So when you think about how people learn to cook, uh, at the at the highest level, you know, people go to catering school, a very tiny, tiny, tiny number of people who decide that cooking is, is their absolute life passion and they, and they really want to become a professional chef. Uh, so they learn, they go to catering school, they, you know, they sort of work under chefs and they uh, participate in master chef uh, contests and sort of come on TV and they, uh, and they kind of become big that way. Right. So that's, so that's one way of really becoming a professional, uh, if you will, but this is obviously not relevant for most of us because it's, it's open to a very, very tiny percentage of the population. And not only is, is, uh, 
the way you cook in a in a restaurant is fundamentally different from the way you think about how you cook at home. So th there is that as well, right? So the second thing is obviously we all learn from our mothers and and grandmothers, right? So um, and this is interesting uh, because in the context of India and many other sort of uh, parts of the world, particularly in Asia, uh, a lot of cooking is mostly done by women who have no choice in the matter. Right? So you have no choice. So the moment you're 12 or 13, you know, you got to learn from your mother and your mother learned from their grandmother. And in some sense, uh, a lot of people in India end up learning cooking by this method that I call apprenticeship. So in the sense that you kind of simply by practicing um, and being an assistant to someone, you kind of learn, you kind of learn the tricks of the trade um, over, you know, over some years. And then after that, it's just second nature. You can just like swimming, you can just go ahead and do it for the rest of your life. Um, and this is fine, except that obviously you can see the, the, the problem with it, right? So one is that literally only half the population seems to be doing this, if at all. Um, and then with the growth of urbanization and the fact that people don't often live with their older parents, people don't often, uh, people live in nuclear families and so on, this apprenticeship model of learning how to cook um, is, is doesn't scale, right? A lot of young people are just finding themselves living by themselves in cities, now figuring out, you know what, I need to learn to cook, right? So therefore, the pretty much the this elephant in the room is that people tend to learn from the internet, right? Um, and to some extent, books. Uh, books used to be the way to learn uh, recipes and cookbooks in the past, uh, but it's largely being replaced uh, by the internet simply because it's easier. Uh, it's easier to simply search for a YouTube video or a recipe on the internet or watch a two-minute Instagram video uh, than sit and read a book, buy and then sit and read a book. So in that sense, a lot of the food content uh, is largely dominated uh, by the internet. Right. So, so this, in some sense is uh, where we are, right? Uh, so option three seems to be the dominant, but obviously there is a, there is a problem uh, with the internet, right? So what is the problem uh, with the internet? Is that, let me first start out by saying that it's first and foremost, it's fantastic. The fact that we're even able to do this uh, session uh, on this literature fest virtually, the fact that it has democratized the ability to create content. Uh, so there are no gatekeepers, anyone can write, anyone can create content. That's absolutely fantastic, right? That's the positive side. The negative side is the fact that it's just, it's just filled with too much information, right? Um, and very little in the sense of what is verified information and what is unverified information. Right. Um, and we can kind of see this. This is not just about cooking. Right. So the Internet has had that positive effect in every area. Right. It has democratized a lot of things. And by that kind of democratization, it's also caused a lot of problems. I mean, you can see this in politics. You can see this in how people are now polarized to the point that each people, everybody has their own sources of facts. Right. So people believe whatever they see on WhatsApp. People believe whatever uh, website that they choose to follow. And kind of that applies to all forms of knowledge, which is that there's a the moment you have a ton of information and no filters and no great ways of verifying what is good and what is bad, uh, you have this problem, uh, which is that uh, it you have to strike a balance, right? So in the sense is you either, it's a Faustian bargain between democratization of information and the search for truth, right? So this is a wider philosophical point, and this is particularly true for food as well, right? Now, the important thing to remember is that when you actually search for food content on the internet, uh, what you get is, is not necessarily just, uh, they call it relevance, but it's really just optimized for popularity right? or search engine optimization. So the first few pages of results are essentially things uh, where essentially the content creator has been smart enough to optimize it to the point where multiple people have either searched or linked to it. And it really, that's what it is. So it's, it's not actually any form of human peer review um, in any meaningful way as the amount of content of the internet actually goes up, right? So the second thing is, is, is also the fact that most food content in India is very recipe centric, right? It's either recipe centric or it's sort of culture and tradition and history centric, right? Uh, and it's not science centric. And I'll tell you why uh, why that is perhaps uh, problematic. In the sense that for that, you know, sort of we have to peel the onion a little bit, more, right? Uh, for starters, recipes. What is a recipe? A recipe is essentially a set of instructions uh, to, to make a specific dish, right? Now, you know, really think back about how recipes are written, that the vast majority of recipes, barring the really, really good ones, which by the way are hard to find, are mostly untested in the sense that they're tested once, right? When you make it um, and then you write about it and you publish it on the internet, right? Um, it's not like you have a laboratory um, and like we are testing vaccines, you don't test it like 100 times and then say, you know what? It's the quarter teaspoon that makes it different and not half a teaspoon. That's not what happens, right? Um, but but most people who are reading recipes end up reading it as if that's it's the absolute gospel truth. And then if I don't follow these exact steps and if I don't 
add this a precisely quarter teaspoon of this and I, 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 you know, do it the other way around, it won't work, right? So a lot of beginners uh, essentially end up getting the wrong idea about cooking if they are learning only from recipes, right? So which kind of brings me to this point about a lot of content on the internet also having this is what, what we call the auth authenticity bias, which is that um, every recipe for every biryani will say, this is the absolute, this is the most authentic, you know, I learned it from my grandmother and so on. The reality is that every recipe in India is authentic to that family and that home. Every family's and every home's recipe is authentic, right? I mean, who's who's calling something else inauthentic? But if everything is authentic, then nothing is authentic, right? So the whole, the, the obsession with authenticity is, is another problem because then people end up thinking that this is the only way to cook something where in reality, it's, it's, it's definitely, it really restricts your way of thinking about uh, adventurism in food as well. And in my experience, I think the uh, another huge problem is this idea of uh, nutrition pseudoscience becoming an integral part of cooking itself, right? Uh, and in India, we just simply can't seem to get away from it, right? Yeah, we will. People will say you add you add turmeric because turmeric, you know, will will help you with Alzheimer's disease. You add Ajwain because it will cure you of gas, uh, or that you should do this because it is good for health, or you should not eat that because that's bad for health. Um, and there's something that you have to remember about. Uh, the distinction between science and pseudoscience, and especially why a lot of nutrition uh, in the context of India's pseudoscience, is that you think about the fact that every, literally every six months, there's a new nutrition book out there, right? There's a new diet, or oh, paleo diet, that diet, vegan diet, that this diet, and so on. And what is interesting is uh, that if if the science was settled, right? I mean, Newton came up with you know uh, 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 Newton's laws. In the 1600s, it did need changing for 300 years until Einstein marginally improved it, you know, with the special theory of relativity, right? But there is a, there seems to be a new fat diet book literally every six months. In our own lifetimes, you know, I grew up at a time when fats were considered bad. Okay? Uh, but now the science is that fats are okay, carbohydrates are bad, right? So it's, 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 this is a constantly evolving space. So what it means is that the moment you kind of mix, bring that pseudoscience into cooking, uh, then you're actually mixing things that don't need to mix. You, should, you need to be broadly aware of health. And, you know, Michael Pollan's advice that, you know, eat, eat food, mostly plants and not too much is, is about the most authentic nutrition advice I've largely seen, unless you have very specific heart issues or specific uh, diabetes and other things, in which case you need a special diet and so on. I think most people tend to kind of mix that nutrition pseudoscience along with cooking. Um, and that's a huge problem. And a lot of content on the internet is essentially filled with uh, those kinds of things, right? Which kind of brings me uh, to my larger point about uh, how we need to think about this, right? So a recipe, as, as I said, kind of gives uh, you a false sense of the fact that uh, steps and proportions are non-negotiable, right? For a beginner, that's okay, because I, I simply want to follow instructions, right? It's like learning, it's like learning music, right? So in the, when you start to learn music, you don't want to improvise and you don't want to make up your own notes. You simply want to follow the instructions. You want to get the fact you build the muscle memory so that uh, you're able to accurately play something that was already composed and then you get good enough to be able to improvise. Right? Now, uh, in the context of cooking, right? Um, if you're just simply following recipes, that's essentially by, like being a beginner musician all your life. Right? Because the what I want to introduce you to this idea of the fact that a recipe is actually a, a model, right? And there's something called a better model. So let me explain that first, right? So a model is something that gives you a template for doing something else or for making something else, right? Uh, a model for a car, a model for a, any object is essentially a set of instructions, if you will, to on how to make that, right? Uh, a meta model is one level above, right? So a meta model is one that says uh, that here's a way for you to generate a model for something, right? In the context of cooking, that is actually far more useful knowledge. And I'll really sort of, you know, bring some examples. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it really comes to sort of like, right? so first, a good recipes are actually models, right? When I say model, they have to, uh, bad recipes don't explain why you do what you have to do. They just tell you these are the steps you have to follow. This is, these are the ingredients you follow. Um, and they don't kind of give you any, what happens if you don't have uh, a specific ingredient? Or do you have an alternative? Uh, what happens if you... Um, if you add too much salt, or what happens if if it's too sour, or what happens uh, if uh, if you skip this entire step? What happens if you don't have an oven, right? Um, and so the problem is that to do that, it's important that the reader actually have the sense that when I do something from your recipe, each bit of those instructions are granular sort of nuggets of knowledge that I can generalize and apply every time I read a recipe, right? 
right? So this is this is so a meta model is actually first required, right? So the other important point is the distinction between art and craft. Right? Uh, the problem is that a lot of Indian cooking is considered art. In reality, it needs to be craft, right? Because craft requires documentation, right? It needs to be written down. And then there is this. Obviously, there's a a bit of a larger historical context here. We've been a a, a culture that has historically not written things down. Uh, there's always been more of an oral transmission of knowledge in general also. And especially when you consider cooking, which again, historically has mostly been done by women in the house. Uh, and women didn't have access to education or literacy literally till about 50 years ago. Right? So there's literally 2000 years of you know tradition that's largely been orally passed on uh, by from mother to mother to daughter and so on. Um, and not really something that's been written down, thought about, generalized in the way that other 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 uh, you know applied sciences or or crafts if you will um, have had the opportunity to do that right so you have like art schools you have music schools uh, you have all of this uh, but you don't have uh, a, a gharana for cooking you don't you don't have that equivalence because it is all considered to be sort of tacit knowledge that's in your head and not something that you can write down right so this is so which kind of uh, brings me uh, let me actually take a very practical example right uh, and the example that I want to give is this idea. Uh, so here's an example of this is an excerpt from my book, right? Where I talk about what is a model for a dal makhani, right? A, a model recipe for a dal makhani. Right? Now, as you can see, one is that the recipe itself is kind of broken down into modular things, each of which it, it either says that it's optional, it's not optional, uh, and so on, right? So you you know, so there's a sense of a flavor base, which again, a lot of Indian cooking. Literally all Indian cooking from all parts of India starts off with heating oil and adding some spices to the oil, right? And the reason you do that is because uh, flavor molecules in spices tend to dissolve in oil, not in water. So you want to do that. And uh, literally all of the flavor of your dish essentially comes from that first step, not the rest of the steps, right? Uh, and then you essentially have a series of these steps. Uh, you have you can add a base gravy, you can add your prep main ingredients, uh, then you can add a stock, you know, you can add water, you could add coconut milk, you could add, you know, meat stock or, you know, leftover dal water from a previous this thing. Uh, and then you need to add an acid to add sourness because without sourness, everything tastes a little bit more bland. Uh, then you need both salt and sweet for it to be balanced. And then finally, ton, ton of things you can do right at the end, right? In terms of garnishing with herbs, in terms of adjusting the intensity by adding cream because uh, adding fat, uh, reduces the intensity of taste and makes things a little bit more muted, if you will, right? Finishing spices like garam masala, which should not be added at the start because you'll lose most of the aroma. So you want to add only right at the end and so on. Uh, and again, the intent here is, is that a model recipe like this is meant to describe why you're doing what you're doing so that it's easy for you to make a dal makhani in many ways, right? Using different kinds of toppings, different kinds of, you know, you can use cream if you want to, you can use finishing oils if you want to, you can do dhungar or smoking if you want to. Uh, and by the way, if you're really experimental, you can use a little bit of alcohol uh, because alcohol really improves the flavor uh, of spices. And while most of the alcohol will actually, you know, burn off uh, and so on. So a lot of Western cooking uses wine or alcohol in the in the process of cooking, uh, which actually adds a lot ton of flavor as well, right? So here, here so in some sense, the interesting thing is that if you ask your grandmother, chances are that she knows all of this, right? She she can make dal makhani with whatever minimal ingredient she has, whatever different uh, things she has at this moment, whatever spices she happens to have. Uh, whereas the recipe, on the other hand, tethers you into thinking about, oh, if I don't have this, I can't make dal makhani. Like if I don't have black cardamom, I can't make dal makhani. That's not true at all, right? So, so that's one, right? But to think of a better model is, is essentially this. A better model is about taking it one level above and saying, you know what, in general, there is this idea of a flavor base, which by the way, I can make with any kind of fat. It does not have to be just ghee, by the way. Uh, it could be mustard oil. Uh, and I use punch foran to get a Bengali base. I can use uh, sesame oil and use curry leaves and garlic to get a, a, a South Indian kind of a flavor. Um, I could use, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, ghee and cumin and others to get a Punjabi kind of flavor, right? So, so the whole point is that you think more in terms of general, general sort of modules. Uh, and then, by the way, you can use the same base. And if you have dal, if you have different kinds of dal, you can make some kind of dal. If you have vegetables, you can make some kind of vegetable. If you have beef, you can make some kind of beef, right? So uh, the whole point here is, is that this, using this meta model, you can generate a thousand recipes in your head, right? So the intent of the book is to make you think along these terms. But to make you think along these terms, uh, you first need to understand 
a lot of the common language, right? So we need a common vocabulary to be able to talk about food in a reasonably universal manner. And by common language, I don't mean, you know, in the, in the sense that Hindi is a common language. I, I meant in the sense that science being the common language of really talking about this, right? So I'll give you a very simple uh, example, right? Um, a lot of recipes will say, cook the tamarind water till the raw smell of tamarind goes away, right? I think that's a terrible instruction, right? How, why, how do you describe to a learner or to somebody who's reading the recipe, what is the raw smell of that, right? And how do you know it's actually gone away, right? It's very, very hard to do that. So the, the better way of really describing that is that cook the tamarind till it's as sour or as less sour as you like it. So that's a far more practical way because you can taste the tamarind and if it's still too sour, then you know the dish will be too sour. So that's what you have to do. If you really want to be truly particular, you can say, uh, uh, cook the tamarind till the pH reaches 4.3, you know, unless you have a pH meter at home, which I suspect you do not. Uh, so you don't have to go that way. But really top end restaurants, uh, at least in the West and so on, uh, have, for instance, discovered that uh, a truly delicious dish is in the range of 4.3 to 4.5 pH, which means that it is slightly acidic, it is slightly sour, right? On the sour side, good dishes tend to be slightly sour uh, and so on, right? So which is why we squeeze uh, a lime juice at the end of most dishes because it adds that hint of sourness, but you shouldn't cook the lime juice ahead because that will actually spoil the taste as well. Whereas tamarind or vinegar, uh, you can cook, right? So when you have something like this, if a recipe calls for tamarind, you could replace that with vinegar if you don't have tamarind, right? Vinegar and tamarind perform the same function. They are acids and they add sourness to food, right? So the point here is that this and many, many more things within the book essentially kind of go into really thinking about, look, how do you build a flavor base? Um, how do you think about gravies? How do you thicken gravies? How do you specifically, what are the distinctions between cooking vegetables versus cooking meat versus uh, cooking uh, eggs versus cooking dal versus cooking rice and so on. And these are different, right? So what kind of reactions happen? If you understand some of those basics, then what happens is that you are a lot more liberated and you, I, I want you to not ignore recipes, right? So my intent is to say, is not to say, please stop reading recipes. In fact, you should read recipes, but read them in a fundamentally different way, right? You should read them in a way that says that, look, this is a canvas for me to experiment, right? Um, and that's essentially the spirit uh, that I want uh, sort of people to think. And, and I want to, uh, one of the things that, uh, and, and I want to sort of st step back a little bit again, right? And and really drive this point home about why why do grandmothers seem to know a lot of these things better uh, than a lot of the content that you kind of see on the internet, right? This kind of uh, stepping back to this larger, uh, and this is an oversimplification, right? Uh, this is a very simplified uh, model for how knowledge tends to be represented in, you know, um, how we look at knowledge and how we gain knowledge itself, right? So it's a, you know, as an IT guy, uh, it's tempting for me to turn everything into a two by two matrix. So on, on one axis is information or knowledge that is verified to the other end is unverified, right? And there's, it's a spectrum. Some, some things are very, very verified and some are completely just made up and there's a, there's a full spectrum in between. Some are partially, you know, true and so on, right? Uh, and then there is this, um, on the other axis is essentially things that are written down, right? Versus things that are unwritten, right? Um, Unwritten knowledge is essentially largely tacit, right? It's, it's, it's not published, it's not written down in a book, it's, it's not even documented somewhere on the internet, it's just in people's heads, right? Now, if you kind of take these two and kind of see different kinds of knowledge, right? So there is published science is, is one extreme. Published science essentially is that you have to experiment, you have to come up with a theory, you have to write a paper, uh, you have to present the data. A peer, uh, a set of your scientific peers have to verify, validate that um, and see that this is actually right. Um, and they have to, uh, and only if if it's peer reviewed, uh, does it get published? And if only if it gets cited, does it actually sort of gain any kind of influence, right? So in that sense, currently, I mean, in some sense, this is the, uh, it, while it's not without its flaws, it is pretty much the best method we have of truly producing very, very highly verified and reliable information. So that's published science, right? Now, um, then there is the broader element of pop science, essentially aimed at communicating and teaching science uh, or teaching some of this to people. You might have to simplify a lot of the media, if you will, kind of plays a role here. It's not as verified because, you know, you could make up some stuff uh, uh, or you could oversimplify some things and so on. So that's popular science. Okay. Um, and then you essentially have this entire gamut of the Internet, which is largely on the unverified side. There are some a few things that are very trustworthy, very reliable. There are some great food blogs. There are some uh, great people to follow. There are some chefs who put out fantastic content um, and so on. 
But largely, the, the universe of cooking content on the internet largely falls in this bigger spectrum that's on the unverified uh, recipe-driven uh, sort of work, right? Then you have, you know, stuff that you receive on WhatsApp. Uh, uh, in fact, you know, people have been drinking things like ginger water, turmeric water uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and actually ending up thinning their blood uh, and having problems, you know, when they actually get operated on and so on. So there is this entire, uh, and the only reason I'm putting it in between written and unwritten is that uh, there's a transient nature to what's happened that uh, you don't know where things came from. Right? Yes, it's it's written, but I don't know what the source is uh, and it could disappear, right? So that's essentially, it sort of straddles that, but it's largely unverified information, right? Then the unwritten, unverified stuff is basically gossip, word of mouth, the sort of stuff we talk about amongst friends uh, and so on, which kind of brings me to a lot of cooking knowledge kind of falls in this area, grandmother wisdom, if you will, right? Uh, grandmother's wisdom, if you will, largely falls under this, right? Uh, this is not to say there are some elements of traditional wisdom that end up being word of mouth or blindly followed and not, you know, or it, maybe it was relevant thousands of years ago, not relevant now. Yes, there is, right? But uh, there is this principle that uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb essentially says, which is that never underestimate the power of knowledge that has withstood the test of time, in the sense that uh, if it has been experimented with, tried out, word of mouth, I mean, sort of tacitly from mother to daughter and so on, every day in the kitchen, right? If something didn't work, it probably would have lost currency many years ago because people are cooking every day, right? So the statistical chance that something that your grandmother tells you will not work, right, is very low, lower than something that you find with the internet, right? So the aim, in some sense, of this book is to really be able to standardize the language, if you will, describe a lot of that tacit wisdom uh, uh, that, that is there in Indian cooking, but unfortunately not written down. Use the language, unambiguous language of science, and kind of move that towards the, the written uh, 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 quadrant, if you will, right, being able to write it down. Uh, being able to uh, sort of make it uh, a lot more verified, right? So you know we kind of have this constant debate uh, even within India, even even on the health side, right? So the often tension between something like say Ayurveda uh, and you know Western medicine, uh, allopathy, if you will, but you know, just medicine, if you will, is the fact that uh, we'll say that a lot of the things uh, in Ayurveda have not been peer reviewed and scientifically put through a double blind test and so on. And this is this is true, right? Because today we're all safe because medicine goes through uh, the published science method, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, a lot of traditional medicinal systems have essentially uh, sort of come over thousands and thousands of years. And this is not just Ayurveda, this is literally tacit knowledge from anywhere in the world has essentially been, you know, what do what does this plant do? What, what do, you know, what does this particular herb do and so on? You cannot discount that knowledge and and not to mention that a lot of actual medicines end up coming the drugs end up being made by those same from those same plant sources as well right it's not it's, it's not all synthetically made as well, right uh, because at the end of the day uh, no chemical engineer can match a plant plants are the greatest chemical engineers in terms of producing sophisticated sophisticated molecules right uh, and so in that sense uh, the aim here is to really take a lot of elements of Indian cooking and create a series of simple, basic knowledge elements, which you can then combine uh, and then be able to document and use a common language to describe a, a lot of this, right? Now, so therefore, in that sense, I really have to maybe, uh, I do have to sort of define food science itself, right? Uh, essentially, it's a very high level way. And at the level that I'm talking about, it's, it's not industrial food science, which is what consumer food companies need in order to produce your chips and all the things that you sort of buy in the store. Essentially, food science is about understanding what happens when flavor molecules and spices, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats interact with each other uh, at various proportions, temperatures, and pressures, right? So this is, if I kind of know 20 of these 30 basic things of what happens, right? What exactly happens when you cook proteins? It's all the same. Whether you cook the protein in a dal or the protein in an egg or the protein in chicken or fish, many of the fundamental things are actually largely the same. When proteins are heated, they get harder. That's just period. Beyond the point, they get really, really dry, right? But at one particular range of temperature, especially if bones are involved, then they get really, really soft uh, because of the gelatin that's produced uh, from connective tissue and so on. So it's just that, uh, so likewise, when you boil an egg, there's a particular temperature range where the egg will be just right uh, and, and so on, right? So essentially cooking proteins is, is a far, far more trickier aspect than cooking carbohydrates or fats. Uh, carbohydrates are, you know, uh, that's 50% of our calories come from carbohydrates. So essentially understanding what are the elements to cooking rice, what are the elements to cooking uh, wheat, and what are the elements to cooking things like, say, potatoes, which are sort of your most common. Now, um, 
all of this is absolutely essential for industrial food production. The aim of this book is to say, what are the basics that are useful for you so that you can actually become a better home cook, so that you can get past this sort of documentation, archival and misinformation universe. Uh, and the challenge is in some sense of uh, nobody's telling you that where do you start if I want to become a better cook? Or is the only way simply to keep trying recipes for years and years till I get better? Or is there a better way? Can I get a series of you know basic building blocks, if you will, right? So that's the sort of uh, aim of this book. And again, it's important to mention this, right? Uh, grandmothers may not know food science, but they know cooking. Right? And that's the knowledge that comes ultimately, right? So the intent of this book is not to say, hey, now that I know, I know some technical terms, I know starch gelatinization, I know protein hydrolysis. No, I'm going to go to my mother and say, hey, you need to do this in order to cook better. I think that's terrible. Uh, I don't think you guys should go and mansplain uh, the women in your house. Uh, instead, learn to cook, learn to cook faster, more efficiently. Uh, and remember that a lot of this tacit wisdom already exists, right? The only thing that we're doing is trying to capture it in a way uh, that is easier for us to document it and be consistent about uh, sharing it with others uh, without loss of fidelity in terms of, you know, by using a unambiguous language, uh, if you will, right? So uh, what I do is that I want to sort of end this talk by having given a lot of this gyan. So it's important that I maybe take three examples of uh, things about Indian cooking uh, that uh, you think you knew, but in, in all likelihood, you, you're probably getting it wrong and how the science explains it slightly better. Um, and again, yeah, there's, a, there's an element here, right? A lot of the things that we end up doing in the kitchen will still produce great outcomes, but we may not know why it does. And we may think that the wrong reason for it is actually producing those outcomes, right? So one is, is that a lot of people think that pressure cooking is measured in whistles. And this is, again, you look at 99% of recipes on the internet, they'll tell you, please cook dal for five whistles, get chana for 10 whistles and things like that. Uh, that's the wrong way to think about pressure cooking, right? Uh, the reason we measure in whistles is because in the past, everyone had the same stuffs, use the same kind of pressure cooker and the same kind of, you know, at high, the heat levels were the same. So the amount of time that the pressure cook, uh, cooker took between whistles was largely the same. So it was a good way to measure, right? But the moment you have induction stubs, you have bigger, better stubs, more efficient stubs and all of that, uh, what will happen is that the amount of time between whistles will go down and it's misleading. Uh, you will end up undercooking rice if you follow the three whistles method and you use an induction stub. So it's important that the right way to actually cook using a pressure cooker is to let it come to one whistle, which is when it builds peak pressure, and then measure time. Right, rice takes six minutes. After that, dal might take eight minutes. Uh, chana dal might take fifteen minutes, and your rajma and chana might take you know twenty minutes, and so on. And that's a better way. And so it's also more fuel efficient because you're not like you know uh, unnecessarily heating your pressure cooker. All you have to do after one whistle is to maintain pressure, not to continue applying heat. Right, and then measure time, and that's when a lot of the cooking uh, actually happens. Uh, and another thing is that in general, uh, meat tends to be uh, needs to be cooked at a lower temperature, right? So not more than 70 Celsius, right? So uh, because of COVID, I think most of us have a, you know, a, a temperature gun. Use that in your kitchen, right? So it's very, very useful. Uh, you would become a much, much better cook if you really understand temperatures uh, in the kitchen, right? So, and pressure cooking always happens at 120 Celsius, which is, you know, well above the boiling point of water, right? Uh, and so therefore, in general, avoid pressure cooking meat unless you're cooking red meat, uh, in which, which already has, is very tough and it needs to be softened and so on, right? Uh, the second bit of science is, is around uh, uh, how well you need to knead chapati uh, in order to get a soft chapati, right? Uh, it turns out that the reason you need to knead chapati is, is that, Atta is actually made up of uh, carbohydrates and proteins. The proteins, there are two kinds of proteins that are relevant here, glu glutenin and gliadin, which kind of form uh, gluten, right? Uh, when you mix water, uh, what happens is that these proteins, unlike carbohydrates, carbohydrates love water. So they want to, the starches want to mix with water. The proteins are a little bit different. There are parts of the protein that want to mix with water and there are parts of the protein that hate water. Okay? So what happens is that as you need water into it, all the water hating parts go to the outside so that they don't have to touch the water and the water, all the water loving parts come inside. That's why you form a dough ball, uh, which other, uh, which, which, which is possible only with maida or atta. Uh, and wheat related things because you need gluten so that all the water hating parts go on the outside and the water loving bits are inside. So that's how you create a dough, right? Now, the more you need, the more you're trying to force water um, into the gluten structures and the quicker it will therefore sort of, you know, align with each other and form that uh, firm structure, right? Now, two things you have to remember. When we're making chapati or paratha, right? 
you actually don't want too much gluten development because too much gluten development means you have to be very chewy, right? So what we've actually done historically is that rather than expect that people will knead very gently, we solve the problem by using a chucky mill, which is how you make atta. And that process actually damages a lot of the gluten ahead of time. So which is why you, it's very hard to make something like bread with, with atta because all the gluten is actually damaged. And to make bread, you actually need a lot of gluten because it needs to rise. Whereas to make chapati, it needs to be flat and uh, sort of flaky. Uh, so that, you know, uh, so all the all the gluten has been pre-damaged, right? So in that sense, it's it's simply letting the dough sit for 30 minutes. Just put the water, gently bring it to a mix and let it sit for 30 minutes. And then you won't need, you won't, you won't need to need it for more than 10, 15 seconds uh, uh, to actually make really, really soft chapati. You don't need to need it like for some, you know, five to 10 minutes and, you know, work out your shoulders, right? Uh, again, likewise, Kind of broader principles, the more amount of water you add to the dough, the softer it is up to a point, after which it's hard to roll, right? Also, adding other things like adding milk or yogurt or eggs to the dough will, will enrich the dough and make the final product softer, right? So a lot of naans in the, the northwest, you know, sort of uh, the frontier side of India and so on will have a lot of the naans will actually have eggs added to the, uh, the naan as well, right? Uh, the, so basically, the more fat you add to the dough, the flakier it is. So which is why in Puri, we use a mix of water and oil. Uh, oil being the fat, so that you actually, there's less water, more fat, and so the puri is flaky as opposed to being chewy. It's not chewy like chapati, right? Although it's made from the same sort of flow, right? So the last one, obviously, uh, is the fact that uh, people think that marination adds flavor to meat. I hate to tell you it doesn't. That like marination adds surface only, uh, flavor only to the surface of the meat, uh, not inside. So if you want flavor to go inside the meat, you have to do something called brining, which is that you have to soak the meat uh, in um, in salt water uh, for very salty water uh, for at least one hour or so, uh, and then wash off all the salt and then use that. Now, the interesting science here is that actually, if you remember your high school uh, sort of biology, right? Uh, when you get dehydrated, uh, people tend to drink water, people tend to drink electrolytes, and it includes salt, right? The reason we drink salt along with that water and sugar, et cetera, the sugar is for the energy. The salt is to prevent your muscles from losing further water to, through perspiration. Because salt prevents muscle tissue from losing water. And that's the same principle that operates here, right? So as long as you're cooking any meat, if you soak meat in, in, in salt water, the salt will go inside and then prevent any further moisture loss when you're actually cooking it. So you'll end up with a more tender uh, sort of meat when you actually cook. It's not marination that does it. Although, again, it's a classic funny thing. So you remember the, the, the joke I started off with latte, right? Um, and the fact that this guy asked for latte and he actually just got a cup of milk. Uh, that's because he expected cafe latte. The Italian thought he was just asking for milk, right? It's very similar here. The word marination actually means to soak in salt water. Mar marina literally means to soak in uh, you know, salt water, right? But the term marination has now changed meaning to, to you know, you know, we put uh, sort of your yogurt and uh, and spices and ginger garlic paste and soak the, the meat in that for a while and so on. It originally literally just meant using salt water. It's just that the term as a meaning seems to have changed. Uh, this is this is kind of the importance of using standardized terminology, and which is why food science is, is kind of important. And last but not the least, don't over marinate. Uh, you know, there's no difference between marinating for half an hour and marinating for 24 hours. Um, people think there is, uh, there isn't. Okay. So with that, uh, go make some delicious food uh, and talk about it and share it with others. Uh, hopefully, uh, in, in in simple scientific language that everyone can understand. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I wonder if there's any uh, questions. Uh... Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So uh, a couple of uh, quick questions. I see. I see that are people uh, uh, on the traditional utensils, right? Um, there is uh, material science is is pretty advanced, right? So the way I would say that is that. Uh, while there are obviously some advantages to cooking in clay, earthenware vessels, and so on, there are some known disadvantages as well. Especially if you don't wash them, uh, there are chances that they could pick up other, you know, fungus and bacteria and other uh, kinds of things. So it is important to be aware of a lot of the modern science while not completely throwing away a lot of the uh, older uh, things. So, so the advantage of using earthenware vessels is 
is that it retains heat very well, right? Uh, so once you kind of heat it up, um, it, it it retains heat a lot more efficiently than say stainless steel or aluminium, which will lose heat, right? But then again, it depends on what you're cooking. So if you're making like a, a gravy, uh, like a fish gravy or something that requires a long cooking time, then an earthenware vessel actually makes sense uh, because you know you can you can you can save on cooking costs because it will retain a lot of it. Cast iron uh, works in a very similar uh, way as well, right? So again, it's it's important to kind of rather than simply say uh, uh, is the traditional way better, the the better way to think about it is that what's the science behind the traditional way? Does the science make sense? Um, and you can be quite neutral about it, right? Uh, um, and if the science makes sense, then I think you should just do it, right? Um, does the traditional cooking increase taste? I think the problem is what is tradition really, right? Uh, so one of the things I often talk about in my book, for instance, that my my grandmother uh, grew up in a small village in, in Tamil Nadu. And uh, when she was growing up, uh, carrots, beans, cauliflowers, all the things that we now ubiquitously see in the market were not available because they were actually called English vegetables. They, they were not, they're not natively Indian. They were introduced by the British. Uh, in fact, the po in fact, if you think potatoes, chilies, and tomatoes, they were introduced by the Portuguese a, a, a little bit earlier. The British introduced a lot of this, so they're called English vegetables even now in the south, right? So they're, they're only used for the more local vegetables. But you know, but when she moved to Chennai, and by the 1970s, she got access to carrots and uh, and beans and others, and she would start using it uh, in her uh, in, in making sambar, right? But so, what is traditional sambar? Does it include carrots and beans, or does it not include? So I, I think sometimes we also have to reframe the question in terms of what tradition is, right? And I would actually argue, and this might be controversial, that in the context of food, there's no such thing. Because food evolves every single day. And it is ultimately an optimization problem. You need to cook in a given amount of time with what you have in the kitchen, and you're going to improvise. And this improvisation has happened in billions of homes over the last thousands of years. Okay? So no, no single person gets to say this is tradition and this is not tradition. Every house does it in a, a different way. So I think that's one way of uh, thinking about it. In terms of cooking classes, uh, it depends. I would say that uh, in the sense that learning from someone practically is better than simply watching a video and trying it yourself, uh, it might be useful. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's, uh, I would say, given that we're in a pandemic and so on, it's a tough set. Uh, uh, I, I think you're better off uh, kind of learning some of the basics of of these different techniques and then really just exploring the internet and learning by yourself so that is what uh, um, i would say all right thank you so much sir thank you so much sir on behalf of orange city literature fest we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance and knowledge shared with us i would like to thank our supporting publisher penguin classics for their cooperation Thank you so much. Thank you. 20 years of existence. Two universities. 23 educational institutes. Offering 137 courses. Rai Sony Group of Institutes.